My lesson this evening, uh, I'd like to talk about Mary, the uh, mother of Jesus, and what the Bible says about her. So the title of the lesson is The Mary of the Bible. As far as, the, as a Bible character is concerned, there's not a whole lot the Bible says uh, about Mary. And what's interesting about today is that, um, as far as I'm concerned, is that uh, Marty was uh, talking about <clears throat> uh, talking to people online. You know, we both have kind of online ministries. Mine is a kind of a, you know, I put a lot of stuff out there, the teaching part. And Marty does kind of personal work online. We kind of got it covered on both sides here. And uh, he was talking about uh, what people do you know, one on one, the kind of misinformation they put out there just on Facebook and so on and so forth. And uh, very, um, very well you know, demonstrated very well the type of arguments that they make. You know? uh, he has the patience of Job to do that. Me, I just, you know, it makes me crazy when I hear them say things like that and you know, cover one argument with another. So he, he definitely is able to, uh, uh, to talk to people like that. My lesson tonight is somewhat the same as his, although we didn't know exactly what we were going to do, except my lesson talks about the misinformation that goes out there, put out there by institutions, not just by individuals. There's a lot of information about the Mary of the Bible that is put out there by the Catholic Church that does not match at all what the Bible says about her. And I'd like to kind of focus in on that, uh, focus in on that tonight. A lot of confusion when you talk to people about Mary what they believe and where they're coming from, because much of their information, certainly if they have a Catholic background, as I do, uh, they have a, a concept of Mary that we don't have, those who have been raised and taught what the Bible teaches about her. For example, <clears throat> when I was a young boy, when I was in junior high, of course I was Catholic, <clears throat> excuse me, and I went to a Catholic high school, and uh, one of our biggest after school clubs, because you have clubs, you know, same thing, back in the day we had clubs too after school. One of our clubs was called the Legion of Mary. The Legion of Mary, you know, like the Foreign Legion, you know, adventure, the French Foreign Legion. Well, we had the Legion of Mary. And we were like soldiers of Christ except for Mary. We had meetings, we were involved in benevolent works, youth camps under this banner. And the idea was that Mary was the spiritual spouse or mentor, or sponsor rather, or mentor of our club. There were pictures of Mary and so on and so forth. Now this seems like a kind of a harmless enough, I mean we were doing good deeds and so on and so forth, it seems like a harmless enough activity, but within Catholicism there exists a lot of ideas and teachings about Mary that have absolutely no basis in Scripture at all. And so in reviewing the character and the contribution of this important historical figure, it's necessary to understand the difference between the Mary of Roman Catholicism that I grew up with and the Mary that is talked about in the New Testament. There's two Marys actually. So when we study the clear teaching about Mary in the textbooks of the Catholic Church and what the Bible teaches about her, we quickly see two very different people emerge. So what I'm going to do here this evening for our study is describe five major teachings about Mary recorded in Catholic catechisms, which I studied as a child and which I taught as a teacher when I was teaching school for the Montreal Catholic School Commission way back when I was in my 20s. So I remember teaching these things out of catechism. And we're going to take those five teachings very quickly and just compare them to the Bible and see what the Bible actually says about Mary in that context. So number one title uh, that uh, the Catholic Church gives to Mary is Mary the Mother of God. Mary the Mother of God. Often said you know, when we pray, let's pray to Mary, Mother of God. Catholics worship Mary and do so enthusiastically and openly. It's called Mariology. They have special prayers directed to Mary. The Hail Mary, probably the most 
popular one, we learned that by heart when we were kids. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, that's where it appears. Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, amen. I mean, I, you know, I remember that as a child, learning it and then teaching it to my class. Now my aunt um, had seven children and every night at 6 p.m. after supper, they would all kneel, I remember this, in the big kitchen and they had the, ro they had the radio on, there was a show on the radio put on by a local Catholic parish and they would recite the rosary, you know, the beads, and they would say Hail Mary and Our Father and various other prayers directed towards God, towards Jesus, and also towards Mary. They believe that Mary is a legitimate object for worship and adoration and they call her the Mother of God in their prayers. Now the Bible calls Mary it gives her a title too, not necessarily a title, but addresses her not as the mother of God, but as the mother of Jesus. You never see in the Bible where they refer to Mary as the mother of God. She was blessed because she was chosen to conceive and bear the human form of God's Son. In Luke chapter one, and if you have your Bibles, let's read exactly what the Bible says about her. Beginning in verse 26, Luke chapter 1 verse 26 says the following, Now in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And in coming in he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation was this. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and for that reason the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she who is called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word, and the angel departed from her. That's the passage that refers to Mary and her pregnancy. What was special about her was that a miracle was performed through her. She conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and not through the normal way of sexual relations with a man. God performed many miracles through people, for that matter. I mean, He performed miracles through Moses and through Peter and through Paul and so on and so forth, but we don't worship them. He even made a donkey talk to a man in the Old Testament. Should we now begin a cult to honor donkeys? Get my point? You know, the one born of Mary was God's son, the creator of all things, Paul says in Colossians 1 verse 16. So to worship Mary is to worship the created thing instead of the creator. And the Bible forbids this type of activity in Romans chapter 1 verse 25. Only God is to be worshiped. Only God is to be adored. That's the first commandment in Exodus chapter 20. And the, own, and the only worship that He accepts is that which is offered through His Son, Jesus Christ. I am the way, Jesus says, and the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, John 14, verse six. So we have Mary, the mother of God, and what the Bible says, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Quite a difference. Another title she is given, Mary co-redemptrix with Christ. Mary co-redemptrix with Christ. Now in the last decade, the Pope has received millions of requests from all over the world among the Catholic Church 
to proclaim a new dogma of the Roman Catholic faith. And that dogma is that Mary is the co-redemptrix or the mediatrix of all graces and advocate of the people. In many a Catholic's mind, a person goes to Mary in prayer and she makes a request to Jesus and Jesus goes to God. I know that might sound unusual to you, but I remember thinking that as a child. I remember teaching that when I taught catechism class. One Catholic Pope, Pius IX, explained it this way, and I quote him, God has committed to Mary the treasury of all good things, that we may obtain everything through Mary. So if somebody says, boy, you're not being fair to the Catholic Church, you're bashing, I'm not doing that. I'm just quoting out of their material. That's, that's, that's Pope Pius IX, that's a quote from him. When he was Pope, John Paul II, even suggested that by virtue of the fact that Mary was for a time at the foot of the cross with John before Jesus died, because of that, uh, Pope, Paul, uh, Pope John Paul II suggested that she shares in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Do you, do you understand what he was saying? I remember reading that. I mean, I remember reading his article. I was in Montreal at the time. I read his article, I was going, oh, ah. In other words, Jesus and Mary offered up a sacrifice for the sins of men. That's the idea. That's the idea of mediatrix. Again, I'm not being hard, I'm just, I'm just reading their stuff. The Bible is very, very, can I say, very, very, very clear about who is and who is not the redemptor and mediator between God and man. There's not a lot of you know, gray area on this subject. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 to 14, um, it says, For God rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Excuse me, 13 and 14. Did you hear the last part? In whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He didn't say Jesus and Mary, he just said Jesus. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Peter says, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Only one Savior. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, Paul says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Only one mediator. The New Testament, very clear on this topic. To suggest that Mary shares the redemptive work of Jesus on the cross or that she in some way is a mediator between ourselves and God is to contradict the inspired writers of both, writings rather, of both Peter and Paul and to dishonor Mary who, if she were alive, would reject such a privilege. You know when they say the old joke, somebody does something and they say, oh boy, that person would be spinning in their grave. Well, the, yeah. She, she would not be a very happy person to think that somebody was trying to put this so-called honor upon her. It is in Paul's estimate a first-class heresy and those responsible for it will be cursed, he says. Listen to what he says, Galatians chapter one. He says, I am amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel which really is not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. You know what it means to distort the gospel? It means to make it say what it doesn't say. To give someone power that they don't have power. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. Number three, Mary, born and lived an entire life without sin. Now in order to exalt Mary to such a lofty spiritual position, you know that she is the co-mediatrix, 
and have it fit the rest of Christian theology, a new doctrine had to be invented. It's difficult to encourage people to venerate and hold up a person who is, after all, a sinner like the rest of us. And so in 1854, the exact year, the Catholic Church gave official approval to the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. This doctrine proposed that Mary was born without sin and thus never sinned in her life. She was sinless. That's what the doctrine of immaculate conception means. And I think, if I, my memory serves me correctly, the feast day of the immaculate conception is December the 8th, 6th or the 8th. Catholics believe that everyone is born with, quote, original sin. In other words, the guilt of sin is inherited from generation to generation through procreation. They reasoned that since Mary was born without original sin, then she was never subject to sin for the rest of her life. Again, I'm not making this up. I'm just going to their books and their teachings and laying it before you. Of course, this is just one mistaken idea trying to cover an older mistaken idea. First of all, the idea of original sin was invented by a monk named Augustine in the fourth century. He was the first to write about it. It is clearly a human idea, not based on New Testament teaching. What the Bible teaches about our sinfulness is quite clear. Sinfulness is not inherited from our parents, Sinfulness belongs to us because we, we disobey. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, I believe, it says, the person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. In other words, you are responsible for your sins. You're not responsible for your father's sins. His sins are, you know, you're not responsible for his. Your children are not responsible for yours. Your father's sins belong to him. Your sins belong to you. Your, your child's sin belongs to them. Secondly, we are born without sin of any kind. Children are not accountable to God for sin. Because Jesus tells us in Matthew 18, 3, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Listen, Jesus wants us to be like children because of their innocence when it comes to sin. <coughs> Excuse me. We know, the Bible teaches us, that we sin when we break God's laws and commands. I mean, we know that from Genesis chapter one. God warned Adam not to disobey his word because that's what sin is, the disobedience of his word. The Bible teaches us that all are sinners, Romans chapter three, verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, if he would have said, all have sinned except Mary, I'd go with it, I'm ready, I'm, I'm, I'm on board, let's do it. But he didn't say that. He says through the inspiration of the Spirit, all have sinned, everybody has sinned. And just to make sure that nobody would make the argument, Peter says no sin was found in him, meaning Jesus. So we have, the, we have one of the apostles inspired uh, telling us that, well, Jesus didn't have sin. The exception right there. We're not making the, the exception. The Bible says he didn't sin. Everybody else sinned except him. They could have included Mary, they made the exception for Jesus to make sure it was clear. Why wouldn't they make it for Mary? Well, they didn't because why? Because she's a sinner like the rest of us. The doctrine that Mary as a sinless person was invented by human teachers, sinful men, not the Bible. The Bible didn't, invite that, it didn't invent that idea. Number four, Mary the perpetual virgin. In a doctrine that was confirmed by the Catholic Church, the Council of Trent, to be exact, in 1545, their council went on for many years to 1563, it is proposed that Mary conceived as a virgin and remained a virgin all her life. Again, if you're going to exalt someone up for adoration, it, it's okay if she has no sin, you know, it'd be a good thing, and that she's a virgin, well, boy, I mean, come on. The notion, 
was born in a time, or this notion here, you know that she was a virgin, a perpetual one, was born in a time when it was taught that sex was somehow you know, less than good, and that the celibate life was more noble and more pleasing to God. It was a time where there were monasteries, the monastic movement was very strong. So it was only natural that in this religious climate a doctrine that would protect the image of Mary as a perpetual virgin would be born. Monks and priests and nuns would have a much easier time venerating a person who was, like they had chosen to be, celibate for life. And so they created a doctrine to suit the purpose, perpetual virginity. There are only two problems with this particular teaching about Mary. One, the Bible teaches that sex within marriage is a good and holy thing, Hebrews 13, 4. The Bible teaches that married couples should rejoice and enjoy their lovemaking because it is a blessing from God, that we are able to have sex and the fact that sexual encounters and sexual intimacy is pleasing and a joyful thing God invented that. God gave us that. God is pleased to give us that gift. We're the ones that messed that up. In Proverbs 5, 18 to 20, the, the, the writer says, Rejoice with the, the wife of your youth. Let her breasts satisfy you at all times. Imagine, the Holy Spirit through Solomon is saying to men in particular, that they should rejoice, be happy. And he's talking about being satisfied with her, with her body. He's talking about sex. He's saying sex is good and it should be good for your entire life. It's a gift from God. So this notion that somehow celibacy is better than marriage, that, <laughs> that's not a biblical idea. And secondly, after Jesus was born, Mary had normal relations with her husband and bore several other children. And we, the Bible even names them in Matthew 1, 18 and Luke 2, 7, Mark 13. You know, we know their names, brothers and sisters. Neither celibacy nor marriage is more honorable than the other. Paul tells us that it depends on your calling and your ability in life. What pleases God is if you are faithful to Christ. That's what pleases Him, not if you make vows of marriage or vows of celibacy. Number five, Mary raised from the dead. This doctrine is called the assumption, the assumption of Mary. It states that Mary was raised in the same way Jesus was so that her body did not see decay in the grave. This was not a required dogma for many years, but, and I'll give you the exact date, on November the 1st, 1950, Pope Pius XII declared this as an official Catherine doctrine, and he said, and I quote, when the course of her earthly life was finished, she was taken up, body and soul, into the glory of heaven, end of quote. This doctrine, he claimed, was revealed to him by God. Once again, we find no basis in scripture to support this idea in any way. As a matter of fact, the Bible is very specific in giving only to Jesus the position as one who is resurrected from the dead and assumed into heaven in a glorious way. In Philippians chapter 2 verse 9, Paul talks about Jesus highly, or the Lord highly exalted him. God highly exalted Jesus. In Acts chapter one, verse nine, it says, he was lifted up while they were looking on and a cloud received him out of their sight. Nobody else gets this in the New Testament. So there, you know, I could go on here, but it would be piling on, I think, you know? It would be like a you know, junior high football game, you know, 60 to nothing. You know, after a while the coach says, okay, you know, everybody slow down here. Now there are other teachings about Mary you know, involving visions and powers and miracles and signs supposed to have been done in her name. Just in Quebec, we have church buildings in Quebec. Some are churches, you know, just where you go to church, and some are shrines. 
And the church building that are shrines, are shrines because miracles were supposed to have happened there. And in many of these, the miracles happened because the individual was praying to Mary and because of that, a miracle happened. So there's a lot of this going on. But I've kept to these main doctrines because these are the official teachings of the church. I can quote you know, chapter and verse, catechism, encyclical, the whole nine yards. Now, we've reviewed these for several reasons. Perhaps in seeing the two sides, you can draw some important lessons here. First of all, <clears throat> let's remember, Mary was an important person. You know, there's not a lot about her, but she was an important character. I don't mean to denigrate her as a servant of the Lord. If you study her life in the Bible, what will you find? You'll find that she was knowledgeable of the scriptures. She was a humble person, a very pious person. She had courage and she had faith. She was all these things and more, but nowhere in any reference to her in the Holy Scriptures was she ever, ever referred to as the mother of God or the co-redemptrix or mediatrix with Jesus. Never does it say she was without sin or she was a perpetual virgin or that she was taken up to heaven in bodily form, meaning she didn't die. Nowhere, you can't find this anywhere. Not even a hint of it, a suggestion. It's made out of whole cloth. All these things are ideas invented long after she died and invented by men, <laughs> not women by the way, men invented this. Theologians, monks, priests, because she was chosen to carry the baby Jesus into this world. This was a great honor. And it was a great honor to her as a woman. After she accomplished this, God did not give her or require of her any special role or position. She too had to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior like everybody else. And we know that she did this because the last place we see her, last place that we have any information about her in the Bible, is that she is with her children and the apostles and the other disciples of Jesus just before the day of Pentecost. In Acts, I think I just want to read that, in Acts chapter one, verses 12 to 14, it says here, then they returned, meaning the apostles, this is Acts one, after Jesus has ascended to heaven. It says, then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, that is, Peter and John and James and Andrew and Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew and James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas the son of James. These with all one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer, watch now, along with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. I mean, just, that's a twofer, by the way, in Oklahoma. That's a twofer, that, that passage there. Because not only mentions Mary, also mentions his brothers. Not his brothers in the Lord. His brother in the Lord, they're mentioned ahead of time, the apostles. His brother, because they mentioned the family life, his mother and then his brothers. That's the last time we see Mary. And it's a good thing, because somebody say, wow, I wonder, you know, what happened to the family, the epilogue? Did they finally believe these brothers that doubted him to say, ah, you're a big shot, go ahead, go to Jerusalem, do your miracles, you know, if you're a big time preacher, why don't you go? So you know, you're wondering, did these guys ever come around? And so we find out in the book of Acts, yeah, they came around, eventually they came around, because they were there, mom and the brothers, they were there. Second question is this, what will you believe? The challenge faced by people in various denominations like Catholicism or Protestantism and other evangelical groups is this, what are you going to believe? And I come back to Marty's lesson this morning and the, the frustration that you have when you see the stuff, you know, <laughs> the stuff that people believe. It's incredible. Are you simply going to believe what the Bible says and only the Bible? Or are you going to stay with the teachings and the traditions of human beings? 
religion, no matter how sincere or how zealous or how ritualistically beautiful, no matter how old it is, no matter how big it is, no matter how popular it is, it's no use if it's not based on God's word. Uh, and every person will be judged by God according to God's word. Quote, he who rejects me, Jesus, and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him on the last day. So how do you feel about your family, Mike? You know, John 12, 48, by the way. How do you feel about your family, Mike? They're all, you know, none of them are members of the church. I don't mean my family, my wife and our children, they're all members, but I mean my family back home, uncles, aunts, grandparents. They're, what about them? They're not married. How do you feel about them? They never, you know. And I say to them, you know what? They're going to be judged in the same way I'm going to be judged. They're going to be judged by God's word. It's not a question of fairness or not fairness or you know, somehow I, you know, I uh, uh, vicariously condemn them because I believe this and I follow this. It's not about that at all. I sincerely believe that when I hear God's judgment on my father and on my grandfather and on my great grandfather, I will say amen. And you know what? My father and my grandfather, they, they'll say amen too. Nobody will doubt God's judgment when it comes. Nobody. What do you think it means every knee will bow, every tongue will confess? What do you think that means? While we're alive and while we have the word, we have a chance to confess willingly our faith. But there'll come a time when we won't be able to not say, oh, you are Jesus, you are the Lord, you are God. Even if it's too late for us, we'll still have to admit that that's the truth. So don't get on me and saying, you know, well, you're too hard on them. I'm not too hard on anybody. Remember, it's not the word of your parents, not even the word of your minister, the pope, the teachers. The word of the Lord is what's going to judge us on the last day. My only job is to point you to this. That's why we judge everything now by this word. If the word supports it, then we support it. If the word rejects it, then we reject it. If the word says, let's do this, then we do it. And if the word is silent, then we are silent with care and prudence and we use our very best judgment. So let the word be your guide in learning about Mary, but also let it be your guide learning about Paul and all the characters in the Bible and all the things that the Bible says that we should or shouldn't do. Let the Bible decide. And let the word be the final arbitrator in what you should or should not do in all areas of your life, whether it's church stuff or your family stuff or your business. So as we enter a, an, another week, you know, the first day of a new week, why not examine our spiritual life according to God's word? And not simply what you've learned growing up or what your religious leader has taught you. And I also mean this for those who've been members of the Church of Christ for their entire lives. Let's always, always make sure that we believe what we believe because it's in the word of, it's in the word of God. And if you see that your life or your actions or your response to God has not been biblical, why not change that? Why not make sure that everything in your life, from the way you treat your wife, children, husband, neighbors, business associates, friends, to how you respond to God to be saved, you know, from A to Z, that all of it will stand the test of being scrutinized by God's word. That, you know, we, we, we encourage people, don't forget to read your Bibles, be regular Bible readers. But I go one step further, don't just be Bible readers, but read the Bible to make sure you shine the light on your life. 
to make sure that your life, your inner life, the life that goes on in your mind, the life that goes on in your heart, the life that goes on in your body, the life that goes on in your home, in your business, in your car, that all of your life will pass the test of the scrutiny of God's word. And if it does, you have peace, you have joy, you have hope, you have encouragement. And if it doesn't, while you're still alive, you still have a chance to change it. If you do need to change it, then we encourage you to come forward tonight as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.